Howdy, and welcome to a bonus episode of Wise About Texas. I'm your host, Ken Wise, and thank you very much for tuning in to this podcast and for loving Texas history. Well, I decided to drop a little bonus episode in the middle of the production schedule due to the tremendous feedback I got on the last episode about the San Antonio Chili Queens. So I'm calling this bonus a second helping of chili, appropriately enough. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the feedback I've gotten and share a couple of more stories that uh, didn't make it into the main episode. This episode is being released between Christmas and New Year, so I hope everybody had a very Merry Christmas. I hope you get a little time off to spend with your family and, of course, to make a good bowl of chili. Uh, It's also cold and flu season down here in Texas, and it's in full force. Man, let me tell you, the weather's cold, which I love, uh, but if I sound a little hoarse, uh, I am an enthusiastic participant in the bronchial troubles of the day, so you're going to have to excuse me. I'm going to spend a lot of time editing out the coughing fits, I hope. But um, the feedback that I got on the San Antonio Chili Queens, I got a lot of questions uh, and a lot of discussion on social media and by email about uh, chili recipes. I even had a friend of mine, David Jennings, who is a blogger. He blogs under the name Big Jolly, and you can find him at bigjolly.com. He uh, even created a chili recipe and gave me uh, some good-natured grief about the tomato issue. And uh, I tweeted that recipe out, and if you email me, I'll send it to you directly. It it looks good. I hadn't made it, uh, but I'm sure it's awesome. Um, So let me tell you, I'm going to group the questions and feedback into some topics. The first thing that people were asking me a lot about is really what was the scene like in the plaza in San Antonio, um, not only just what it looked like, but kind of what it felt like and why did this become such an important cultural institution. And the idea is that these the, the plazas were full of these, as I described them, many Mexican restaurants. Each little set of tables was basically a full Mexican restaurant. And it became a place to go. It became not only a tourist attraction, but a community gathering place. And when people came to the plaza, to eat the chili and other items from the Chili Queens. It was uh, everybody from the mayor down to the everyday citizen. And uh, everybody came, everybody was treated the same, everybody was sort of in it together, and it was just a wonderful community environment. The other important part of that was that it was really the time that not only chili, but also other Tex-Mex items that we now consider staples were introduced to the broad public outside the Hispanic community. I think what I've gleaned from researching a lot of the late 1800s articles is that the the food that we take for granted uh, today is Tex-Mex, which which I know uh, and my doctor knows I eat several times a week, um, really was introduced to the public. Um, You know, the non-Hispanic community in San Antonio was not making chili at home until these Chili Queens introduced it, and it got broader appeal. In 1893, at the Chicago Exposition, some people from San Antonio set up a chili booth, and that introduced chili to the Midwest. Now, I would contend that they've screwed it up, but, I, you know, whatever, uh, to each his own. And uh, they've let, let's just say, instead of screwed it up, let's say they've put their own regional stamp on it. How about that? That's a little more charitable way to do it. Um, but uh, that, that introduced chili to the northern climate where, of course, it goes really well because it's always cold up there. So anyway, that was the important part, cultural part of this, uh, the scene of the Chili Queens. Now, the second thing that uh, you can imagine was much discussed behind that last episode was the recipes and the seemingly eternal controversy over beans and tomatoes. Well, um, I made my stand perfectly clear last time, uh, no beans and preferably no tomatoes, although I'm a little more flexible on that. Um, And I did so because, hey, it's my podcast. So uh, we don't have a phone line to call in on, so uh, I just get to say it. But really, uh, this is a history podcast. And when chili was made by the Chili Queens of San Antonio, they were not using beans. Now, here's something that's interesting. In some of these newspaper articles, they would discuss how this chili was served. And one of the ways it was served to the customers is it would be poured over beans. So... The chili was cooked separately and uh, then was served with beans. So I'm going to propose that as sort of a 
uh, diplomatic compromise on the issue. So if you uh, would uh, like to serve me a bowl of your chili, which I highly encourage, uh, email me at host at wiseabouttexas.com, and uh, you want to serve it over beans, I'll go with it. So uh, that was that puts the bean issue hopefully to rest. But th- there is, uh, if you will Google the Institute for Texas Cultures, uh, you will find one of the original Chili Queen recipes. And uh, the center of this dish really is the dried chilies. That's the that's the main part of it. That's what sets it apart. And uh, also in that original recipe, you will find no tomatoes. Uh, but like I said, we're going to be a little more flexible on those tomatoes because um, there are lots of great recipes that use tomato paste, tomato sauce, stewed tomatoes. And I've made several recipes uh, that were excellent that included tomatoes. And and I think it, the, the sum total of all this is that... Uh, we can safely say that chili has evolved much like many other food items. So we're all just going to uh, try to get along when it comes to chili. And let's all just eat a lot of it and enjoy it. All right. Uh, next, I want to tell you a story that I left out of the main episode. And it's another story about the expansion uh, of chili to the masses. The chili was very popular in San Antonio. Uh, but until that 1893 introduction in Chicago, not really popular outside San Antonio, until a gentleman named William Tobin decided to can chili and sell it to the military. So William Tobin was born in South Carolina. He was born in 1833. He came to San Antonio with his brother in 1853, and he got married. He married a lady named Josephine Smith. Now, this is important uh, for Tobin's standing in San Antonio because Josephine Smith's father was John William Smith. John William Smith had been in San Antonio since 1827, married to Maria de Jesus Delgado Corbello, who was a descendant of the Canary Islander settlers of San Antonio, the original settlers. Smith carried Travis's final letter out of the Alamo to the convention at Washington on the Brazos, and he later fought in the Battle of San Jacinto, Uh, That made him very popular and a hero in San Antonio, and he became mayor of San Antonio for three terms during the 1830s, and he served in several other offices in San Antonio. He was an alderman. He was the tax assessor for Bear County. He was the county clerk. He was the um, clerk of the probate court. He was treasurer. He was a postmaster. Um, He was a senator in the Republic of Texas, so he was a very, very prominent citizen. So... William Tobin's fortunes uh, increased when he married Josephine Smith. Together they had 10 children. Tobin was a Texas Ranger in 1855. He was city marshal of San Antonio in 1856. And uh, he fought under with another group of San Antonio volunteers. He fought in the United States Army during the uh, Cortina Troubles along the border. Now I'll do another episode on Juan Cortina, but he was a a raider who would come from Mexico, steal cattle, etc. Um, he was also a hero, a folk hero to the northern, uh, in the northern part of Mexico, because the perception was uh, that he was actually more of a Robin Hood character. But uh, as you can see, there's a lot to talk about about Cortina. But those were some significant events during Tobin's service. He got the idea that chili con carne would be an excellent food to put in cans and sell to the military. So he built a factory in the early 1880s and went and got a contract with the Army to sell them this canned chili. The military was very excited about this situation, and uh, there were lots of newspaper articles written about the healthy properties of the chili. And certainly the name Chili Con Carne uh, suggests that it was made with beef But the chili that Tobin sold to the military actually was goat meat. So it's unclear whether he started with beef and shifted to goat. Now, goat, obviously, much lower cost to produce. Uh, It's unclear uh, whether he started with goat or not. And I have looked but have been unable to find the actual military contract in the archives. But I'm very curious if that contract specified what that chili would be. Nevertheless, it was very popular. He sold it in stores as well. And this was the first time. Uh, that chili appeared in a can 
Um, Tobin died in 1884, very early in the process of uh, selling his chili, so we'll never know if Tobin would have been one of the uh, early famous entrepreneurs of the canned chili business. So speaking of canned chili, which remains very popular, let me tell you one more quick story. In 1895, there was a a boy named Lyman Davis, and he lived in Corsicana, and he started making chili and selling it out of the back of a wagon on the streets of Corsicana, and he called it Lyman's Famous Homemade Chili. When he grew up, he opened a meat market, and he continued selling this chili, and it was Uh, It had become very popular in Corsicana and no doubt in the surrounding areas. And he decided he needed to start canning and selling this chili. So in 1921, uh, he started canning his famous chili con carne. And he decided that he needed to name it something other than Lyman's famous homemade chili. So uh, Mr. Davis had a pet wolf. His wolf was named Kaiser Bill. So he decided to call his product Wolf Brand Chili. Mr. Davis continued to grow his business, and eventually uh, something really good happened to Mr. Davis. They discovered oil on his property, uh, which tastes much better than chili, especially if you own the mineral interest. So Mr. Davis sold Wolf Brand Chili to two Corsicana businessmen, one named West and one named Slauson. And uh, they, of course, continued the company, and Wolf Brand Chili remains very popular and famous today. But it all started with young Lyman Davis and his famous homemade chili in Corsicana, Texas. All right, we can't uh, finish this second bowl of chili, this second helping, until we talk about chili cook-offs because those are so popular. And I I had a lot of discussion uh, with people on social media about these chili cook-offs. Now, most of the time when you think about the chili cook-offs, you think about the World Championship in Terlingua, which the first of which occurred in 1967. Um, however, there were chili cook-offs before that. And if you do a little research in the newspapers, you'll find uh, as far back as 1952 uh, that there was a chili cook-off at the uh, Texas State Fair. So it did start uh, a little bit earlier. But the 1967 uh, Terlingua Championship originated as a dispute in the newspapers. There was a a journalist in Texas named Frank X. Tolbert, and Mr. Tolbert wrote a book called A Bowl of Red about chili. And uh, one day in 1967, August of 1967, uh, there was a magazine called Holiday Magazine, and a writer named Alan Smith, or H. Alan Smith, wrote an article entitled, Nobody Knows More About Chili Than I Do. And he claimed that not only that he was the best chili cook in the world, uh, but that nobody in Texas could make good chili. And he included a recipe in his article, and you guessed it, it included beans. So Tolbert, who had a column in the Dallas News, started a war with him in the media. Uh, One of Tolbert's readers suggested that a uh, famous chili cook named Wick Fowler should challenge Smith to a cook-off. They decided to hold the cook-off in Terlingua, Texas, and the challenge ended in a tie because the third judge apparently declared his taste buds ruined and that he could not go on and make a decision in the contest uh, and that it would have to be repeated all over again, which it has been since 1967. There are now two chili cook-offs in Terlingua and two main uh, chili societies. If you go to chilicookoff.com, you'll find the Uh, ICS or International Chili Society. And if you go to Cassie Chili or C-A-S-I Chili dot com, you'll find the Chili Appreciation Society International. There's a little bit of controversy in the chili cook-off world, which we're not going to get into uh, in the spirit of serving chili over beans. We're going to appreciate all chili cook-offs and all chili cooks. I certainly encourage you to check out uh, the Trilingua situation because it is a heck of a party. Well, those are a few bonus stories uh, in this second helping of chili. Thank you so much for listening to Wise About Texas. Thanks for the great feedback on the San Antonio Chili Queens. Uh, Keep the recipes circulating on social media. You'll find uh, the Wise About Texas Facebook page. You'll find us on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. And during these uh, few days of cold weather here in Texas, I hope you'll go out, find your favorite recipe, 
and make yourself a big bowl of red. Thanks a lot for listening. Go out and do something for Texas today. Until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.